I think we're going to start uh, bang on time. I'm Stephanie Flanders, Head of Economics and Government at Bloomberg. And this is the fiscal panel. Fiscal expansion, a welcome return or ticking bomb. Um, I guess we've had a long time when governments could borrow a lot more but pay much less overall in debt servicing costs. You had this extraordinary period after the global financial crisis where uh, certainly across Europe, uh, debt ratios roughly doubled, but in every case, their cost of debt servicing as a share of GDP had actually gone down over that time. I think we've also, during that time, not really faced any tension in responding to economic major economic crises between fiscal and monetary policy. They were both kind of pointing in the same direction. Um, and in the last 12 months, both of those things uh, have changed. And we're back to what some would call a more normal time for fiscal policy. It's certainly a very different time, and it's been a very challenging time as governments try and face a trade-off um, between responding to cost of living crises, but also not uh, making the bank, central bank's job any harder. So we're going to try and get straight into some of the implications of this particular period for fiscal policy. Um, short and long term, but I'm going to try not to have too much time thinking about the immediate outlook since that's been the topic of so many other sessions in and around um, Davos. We have a, a superb um, panel. If I just start from uh, the far end uh, of um, the stage, uh, Raghuram Rajan, um, Professor of Finance at the University of Chicago, uh, Booth School of Business. Um, next to him, uh, the European uh, Commissioner for the Economy, Paolo Gentiloni. Um, Gita Gopinath, first Deputy Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund. And the Minister of Finance of Thailand, Akom uh, Tempitaya Pesit. Yeah, correct. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Gita Gopinath, can I, can I start with you? I mean, I guess just in um, responding to what I just said, I mean, how do you see that trade off today? between monetary and fiscal policy. I think we tend to always say there are no trade-offs. Um, but, and how have countries responded? You know, which, which countries have done well in, in handling that difficult balance? So we are in a, um, a unique time because of inflation. I mean, this is the fact that we have the kinds of inflation that we hadn't seen. And we saw that particularly in 2022. We see it coming down some now, but it is still high. Uh, and so that's what generates the tension between monetary policy and fiscal policy. And while we have inflation and we need to bring inflation down, we also have the issue that there is uh, uh, high prices, again, last year particularly, but it continues into this year, high prices for energy, high prices for food, which then calls for fiscal policy to provide support to the most vulnerable in society. So you have an inflation problem you have to deal with, but you're still hit with shocks like food shocks and energy shocks that require fiscal policies to step up. And that's what's making the current conjuncture uh, particularly difficult. And um, what's important to keep in mind, though, is inflation has helped a little bit with on the debt story. So if you look at uh, what happened to public sector debt globally in 2020, it went up to around 99% of, of GDP. Uh, and now it's... Uh, come down to around 91% of GDP. Uh, and that's because of a combination of the recovery, but also because of the uh, inflation, inflating away some of that debt. Now, at 91%, it's still around 8 percentage points higher than it was, what it was pre-pandemic. So there is still a debt problem uh, that countries have to deal with. But inflation and the recovery has, has reduced uh, the, the size of that increase uh, in the debt. In terms of what countries need to do to manage this difficult trade-off right now, I would say fiscal policy has to uh, accomplish three things, which is one, it should be consistent with bringing inflation down, which means at the minimum, it should not be expansionary uh, or at the overall level. Again, because of uh, the fact that we've had a lot of pandemic-specific measures being taken off countries. Countries have been able to actually accomplish that. They've been able to accomplish that we can provide support to, the, to our population for energy mm -hmm. reasons or food reasons. 
because we've taken off some of the pandemic measures. So this is not kind of this classic kinds of fiscal consolidation that we've seen. We haven't seen that uh, yet. The second thing that fiscal policy should keep in mind is indeed to make sure that you are protecting the most vulnerable and they need to, to do that. Uh, again, when it comes to food and energy, these are very important fundamental essentials for, for uh, households. You need to provide support for that. Uh, and the last thing is it's absolutely essential at this time to have a sound uh, and communicate a sound medium term fiscal framework with clarity on bringing down debt <coughs> over time and, and building up buffers in the medium term. Minister, do you see a difference in the trade-off that you faced or that emerging market economies have faced? As in many ways, they've done um, better in the past year. Uh, certainly, most of the major emerging market economies have done better than we might have expected. Well, I think the, uh, probably still it's quite different because the, uh, we are more cautious about the, uh, running the, uh, the fiscal policy and the monetary policy as well. But uh, actually, for the past two years, three years actually, during the pandemic, the monetary policy and fiscal policy is working closely. We are working closely. And the, uh, thank for the monetary policies that to allow fiscal to, to do more work. Because uh, in our case, the, uh, for two years, the, we borrow 1.5 trillion Thai baht. But actually, it's not uh, the biggest borrowing in, in the world, I think, because we uh, carefully look at the how we, uh, in the future, that we can pay paying uh, this debt. Uh, but at the same time, that the, uh, you know, how, how we get this 1.5 trillion is the, uh, you know, we expand the our, lifting the our uh, debt ceiling according to the, uh, in order to give more uh, fiscal space uh, for the government, okay, from 60% to, uh, to GDP to 70%. That's by our definition, but the, our uh, debt performance is now, uh, by def our definition, is the 60%, which still in, the, in line with the, 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 the old ceiling, okay? Um, but by the IMF definition, our public debt is only for 55, I think, 55, which is not high, okay? But the, uh, uh, after two years, I think the, uh, then, it's not only monetary policy has to do more work, but the fiscal policy is the, uh, become normalized as well because we go back to work on the, how we pay back the debt. So there are two things. The one is the, uh, whether the government will still uh, keep spending. I think the, this is important because the, uh, you know, in Thailand, uh, the, uh, uh, there's a backlog of the capital investment, particularly for the infrastructure. So we set the, uh, at least the 20% of our national budget for capital e uh, expenditure. So the fiscal policy in terms of the budget policy is the uh, expansion, expansion. But the thing is the, uh, uh, we have to minimize, minim minimize our deficit because we have been running uh, deficit for almost uh, 20 years. So it's time now that uh, we should, uh, you know, put our uh, budget deficit down to below, below to uh, 3%. But how we do that is the, uh, on, the on, on the other side, the, uh, the revenue collection. The revenue collection is important. We have to expand our tax base. Right now that we should not, uh, we will not a be able to talk about the personal income tax because it has been very low already. The corporate income tax is low. But what we can do is the expansion to a more uh, digital tax, <laughs> electronic service, for example, and you know, uh, getting the more people and more uh, startups to be in the system. So that's the, that's the, that's the uh, what we are doing right now. So uh, the policy, physical policy, okay, we still spend, but with the less uh, deficit by increasing the our revenue up to um, because the. In the past, uh, our revenue collection to GDP is, is declining from almost 20% uh, down to the 13%. So this is our job that we have to increase our capacity in, the, in terms of the revenue collection in order to finance all the project. But the other thing is the, uh, you know, as I said, you know, the backlog of the infrastructure, which now we're not focusing on the physical, uh, physical infrastructure, but on uh, more on the digital infrastructure as well as the, you know, innovation infrastructure. How we finance? So, uh, 
some of the project, uh, which is large scale project, has been uh, granted to the private sector in the form of their PPP. So more and more project to to the private sector, so in order to share the cost between the the, the government and the the private sector. And Commissioner Gentiloni. Uh, is this, this is year going to be, um, Gita Gopin has talked about how some of the measures you've been able to handle the trade-off in many ways by removing exceptional measures that were taken, the sort of one-off fiscal supports. Um, it's harder to do that this year. Is this going to be the toughest year for European governments? Uh, well, we had a lot of tough, <laughs> toughest years. It's always going to be I tougher think, next year. I think we had a three or four year stress test for, for our economy. On the COVID crisis, it was a love affair between monetary and fiscal policy, completely uh, in line. I remember mid-March, we decided together uh, fiscal support and uh, extraordinary purchase program from the ECB in the very same days. Uh, now, of course, the situation is uh, completely different. Uh, inflation. Um, what, what is the, I, I fully share that uh, the target is to avoid that fiscal policy compete with the monetary policy. We should complete it. Easy uh, to say, not so easy to, to put in practice. Why? Because we already had the need uh, to leave the universal support that we had during the COVID pandemic and go to a more uh, targeted uh, form of support. We had, for the first time in Europe, common programs, the next generation EU, that are financing investments. Um, but then the war and the COVID and the energy crisis changed a little bit the picture. I think we should be aware of the fact that this crisis is affecting all the world uh, in geopolitical terms, but on <coughs> economic terms, um, Europe and the emerging economies, uh, the global south, if you want, are more affected than other advanced economies from this crisis. So the, the challenge now, in my view, are mainly two, if we want have this good coordination between monetary and fiscal policy. Uh, first, how we are able uh, to uh, avoid that the expenditure and the measures to address the energy crisis uh, remain universal and uh, time unlimited measures. Um, this could be a, a danger, That's just to make you an example, we spent at the EU level uh, in 2022 1.3% of our budget on uh, energy prices related measures. If you look to the draft budgetary plan for 2023, <coughs> this 1.3 goes down to 1%. But this decrease is based on the assumption that uh, is in the draft budgetary plans of member states that you will gradually uh, phase out these measures, uh, limit them, uh, go to more targeted measures. If this doesn't happen, if we continue the measures that we have in place, the overall burden will be 2%. So we will go from 1.3 in 22, not decreasing to 1%, but increasing to 2%, which means with the more moderate level of growth that we will have next year in European Union, that the period that we had in 21 and 22 of reduction of deficit and debt after the skyrocketing increase uh, of the COVID crisis could be under pressure. So this is our first uh, issue. And we discussed, we discussed also yesterday um, with finance ministers, it is not easy to phase out these measures, of course, from a social point of view. 
But the longer you keep them, and you keep them universal, the riskier their phasing out is. Because these measures were only you also useful to curb inflation in some countries. But when you phase out them, if you make this too far in the, in the coming months, if you keep them in place for a too long time, when you will phase out, you could have a spike again in inflation. So we have to phase out them, make them more targeted, uh, as is in the budget plans, quite soon. And this is a political challenge. I, I know very well that it's easy to preach this from Brussels. It's a little bit more difficult to uh, implement this from the different uh, governments in different member states. Second challenge is that we need to keep a good level of uh, public investments in strategic areas. And this is what, for me, is very encouraging, looking to the budget that we have for 2023, is that public investment is not decreasing. It is increasing. It is exactly the opposite uh, of what happened after the financial crisis, when we had five or six years of continuously decreasing public investments. Because we need the other component of this difficult situation is that, yes, we have inflation. Yes, we have to support the vulnerables. But we have also to continue to support our transition investment. Otherwise, we will, the disadvantage that we have in Europe in terms of energy prices will last for long. And to go further with this disadvantage, we have to increase our capacity on the green transition, etc. Here, I, ha I have an optimistic picture because I see that there is an awareness in the Union to keep our also thanks to the common programs, of course, to keep our investments uh, for the strategic future um, goals uh, strong. And this is good, I think. I want to get into <clears throat> how fiscal policy can still be used for some of those long-term uh, investment priorities. But Raghuram Rajan, you no longer have the burden of being a central bank governor. Um, just at the most sort of basic level, Peter's mentioned that actually inflation has made it a little bit easier to see debt stocks fall in nominal terms. But of course, again, completely basic, the cost of <laughs> borrowing has gone up. How is this, how do you think fiscal policy makers should be thinking about fiscal policy as a tool given these two things? Absolutely, so, so let's start with why spending was so easy, the coordination you talked about. I mean, Part of it was that central banks had anesthetized bond markets with QE programs. Uh, Long-term rates didn't move much as borrowing picked up. The problem is some of it was hidden. Uh, what central banks are doing is buying long-term debt, financing it with overnight money. When you put the balance sheet of the central bank together with the government balance sheet, what that effectively means is over the period of QE, uh, governments have actually reduced the maturity of their debt, made it much more interest sensitive. Perhaps the outlier here is Japan, where uh, the Bank of Japan holds 50% of government debt, which means as interest rates pick up in Japan, you will see the consolidated balance sheet being hit significantly. Already the Fed is actually making <coughs> negative income on its, con on its balance sheet, which means the dividends the Fed pays to the government 83 billion, I think, was, uh, was in good times, is going to come down to zero and actually look, look negative. That doesn't mean the government has to replenish the central bank, but it does mean that the consolidated balance sheet is much less long term than we thought. So higher interest rates hit harder earlier in, in many of these countries. Of course, the other problem is that the size of the debt has gone up <laughs> tremendously over the last few years. And that's actually a, an interesting issue, which is why has fiscal discipline broken down? And so one argument is, oh, we've had all these extraordinary crises, and that is true. But we've had three once-in-a-lifetime crises in the last 20 years, right? The global financial crisis, we've had the, the pandemic, and now, of course, the consequences <coughs> of the war. 
part of the problem that's going on is clearly there is a fractured political consensus in many industrial countries. I mean, that is part of the reason the US overspent. Every constituency got a share of the spending, simply because they couldn't make choices. So forget targeted spending. It's universal plus in the sense that what you had was banks, which should have suffered losses during the <coughs> pandemic, didn't suffer any losses. Why? Because you had the Paycheck Protection Program, which went to the small and medium firms correctly, but then it went out through the back door directly to the banks to repay the loans. So in some sense, we've bailed out everybody, right? And that is the problem. Spending today is highly untargeted, including the energy spending that is, uh, the, the, the spending on power that is happening in, in Europe. How do we bring it back sort of under control. I think Mr. Gentiloni uh, uh, expressed a, a concern here. Now, what does that mean for the longer term? It means that fiscal and monetary will remain more in conflict rather than coordination going forward. Central banks are clearly determined to bring inflation down, but with spending still high, plus the prospect of spending not becoming more targeted over time, does imply that inflationary expectations, inflationary consequences will be higher for longer. So, uh, I mean, I guess the bottom line is how does this impact government budget since we're talking fiscal? Um, I think what matters is the level of real interest rates going forward. The slowing in growth because of deglobalization, because of uh, you know, China slowing down, et cetera, because of aging populations, will certainly dampen long-term core real interest rates, right? That's, that's one reason. Aging mixed effects. Uh, I think Goodhart and Pradhan make a good case, uh, but there have been counter arguments. So we don't know how aging will impact long-term real interest rates. But what is clear is the inflation premium will add to long-term real interest rates if there's conflict between fiscal and monetary. So net effect is certainly if we can get inflation under control, nominal rates will come down. Unclear what will happen to real rates if we don't get the consensus. Last point. Uh, I will make, you know, there's a lot of, you know, need for green investment. We uh, heard again that, uh, uh, you know, countries need to do more of it. The real question is who's going to bear the burden of green investment? The more you focus on incentive structures given by the government, subsidies here, subsidies there, uh, what that does is put the burden on the public sector balance sheet. The more you focus on regulation, you know, carbon tax this, or, or emission controls and so on, the more it comes on the private sector. Right now, it seems, certainly in the US, the consensus is it's too hard to put it on the private sector. It goes on the public sector balance sheet. We just saw the Inflation Reduction Act full of incentives of one kind or the other. So I, I think this is yet another place where fiscal needs to think very hard. Given the breakdown in consensus, given the fracture, are we going to take the easy route and not impose some of the costs of the transition on the private sector, take it all on the public sector balance sheet, which means the public sector balance sheet has yet more burdens going forward, which means yet more premium in unexpected places. Ruggers put a lot <coughs> of things on the table. Can I just come back to you, uh, Paolo Gentiloni, just because obviously in the, <clears throat> the first part of what he was saying, uh, the, the fact that the tension's actually going to get worse between the fiscal and the monetary. I mean, obviously, you feel that most intensely in the, in the zone that where fiscal and monetary are most segregated. Um, do you think, I mean, is Europe ready for the continued tension that comes from the ECB following its mandate, but the, the build-up that we've seen in borrowing over these years at much lower rates? Well, the EU, of course, is, the, is very flexible. So the, the capacity of adapting adaptation is extraordinary. We have a, a difficult, to, to, to put it diplomatically, uh, decision-making uh, process, but we have also a lot of um, capacity of, of adaptation. So honestly, I'm not um, expecting uh, big uh, uh, tensions. Uh, provided that we are able to uh, address the issues that I was uh, mentioning, so that we are able to uh, 
move these uh, measures in support to energy in a more uh, targeted way. And this is what uh, all the European institutions are preaching for. It's not the ECB that is saying uh, you, you, we need to have more targeted measures and the European Commission uh, saying the opposite. We are, we are working together in the same direction. Results are mixed because it is not easy uh, at all. Um, and then also, uh, and I repeat this, because of the asymmetry uh, of the impact of this crisis, because it is true, uh, of course, that uh, we have to move uh, on energy measures, um, leaving this uh, universal plus approach that you have referring to, but it is also true that we have a competitive disadvantage on energy prices. Uh, we are talking a lot about the IRA, uh, okay, this is good, uh, but the, the competitive challenge for our industry is coming first of all on the disadvantages on energy prices. IRA is coming a little bit on top of this. And it is a real challenge for Europe, for the EU, uh, because uh, being very uh, strong and advanced on regulation, we were very demanding on uh, regulation for the green transition, for the fit for 55, for the car industries, and whatever. If you have this pressure on regulation, that, that is a pressure on the private sector, mostly, and at the same time this disadvantage, you could have a competitiveness concern, which is what we are discussing now, as you know, but in Europe. Just to get back to the fiscal, I mean, you say it's hard to make decisions. The Commission has proposal, is, is, wants to have new proposals for the, fiscal, for the stability and growth pact, for the fiscal rules going forward, but there's no written proposal yet for governments to discuss, so why not? <laughs> well, the, the, the way in theory is clear. We, we are working to build a consensus on our proposal, and after reaching this consensus, which is uh, in our plan, possible in March, this is what we are working for, then we will come with uh, a legislative proposal and concrete proposals which will take time, but you know, if you have a political consensus uh, in the period between this consensus and the final approval of legislative changes, the Commission could exercise its power of interpretation, as always, of the rules. Um, the point is that we are not yet uh, having this consensus, so we are working. And you don't expect to have a written proposal before, yes, after, March, before after, March, though, <coughs> not before March? Well, we will make proposals <coughs> when uh, member states will have reached a, a decent level of consensus. Yeah. We don't need unanimity, but we need a large, large consensus. Peter Gopin, I mean, what, I wondered what, you, what your response was to some of, the, some of what Raghu was saying, um, both on the long-term prospect, the yeah. prospect for rates, but also this emphasis that perhaps we haven't heard so much from the IMF on the consolidated balance sheet and the sensitivity now of of government borrowing to interest rate rises? Uh, so, f you know, I do agree with uh, Raghu that we have moved into a period where the expectation is from citizens is that fiscal policy will be used to address the problems that they're facing with. Uh, and so there is very much, there's, there's a more uh, eager sense on deploying uh, fiscal resources and to do that even through deficit spending I think has certainly uh, uh, become more popular. Debt levels are also high. So I think those two factors move in the direction of saying that you know, real interest rates in the future could be higher than what we've had in the past. But there are the more standard forces that still weigh in the opposite direction. We have inequality, <coughs> which keeps interest rates low. Demographics, yes, I think there could be a tip turning point when demographics actually works in the other direction and raises rates, but I don't think we're there yet. It still moves in the direction of keeping interest rates uh, low. 
Uh, and so it's hard at this point that when you do the analysis and you look at the different factors that drive interest rates to say that while we have you know, good reason to believe that interest rates, real interest rates, will be significantly higher than what it was pre-pandemic. I think there's uncertainty there, uh, but not a strong sign that it's going to move uh, much higher. On the part that uh, Raghu made, I think he made a very interesting point about whether we're going to remain in this conflict for a while and whether that's going to have implications for inflation uh, expectations uh, and so on. Well, I think we can take some comfort that as of now, I don't see that dynamic playing out, which is, you know, we do see, we, we are seeing in, with monetary policy interest rates going up with the tightness that we've seen, uh, we are seeing inflation expectations behave in a very well-anchored fashion. Short-term inf inflation expectations are coming down. So, um, so yes, yeah, so we haven't really tested the limits of uh, that tension yet. I think it is still the case because a lot of the old measures were coming off that uh, you know, as, you know, in Europe, uh, for instance, that you can do the, the additional measures in terms of energy uh, uh, transfers and energy subsidies without having an actual overall increase in the fiscal deficit. So I think that, that, has, uh, that has helped so far, but that tension can come up. But again, right now, uh, it's not something that we see. And the last point I would make is, I guess, maybe compared to the past when, uh, you know, the markets were relatively sanguine about additional debt being put on the markets. I think what we've seen, seen is investor risk sentiment at this point is much more sensitive to fiscal packages that then seem inconsistent with bringing inflation down. We saw that most starkly for the UK, but we're seeing that for, uh, for other countries in the world too. So there is a little more disciplining that's coming from markets too, which I think would help again, maybe uh, support the, pr the prevalent view, which is that yes, we need to help, we need to help uh, our vulnerable population. We need to help, you know, in some cases, a large swath of the population, but we really cannot be driving up deficits and doing a lot of deficit spending at this time. Just briefly, I mean, but on something like the Fiscal Monitor, <clears throat> which is an incredibly useful document that the IMF produces with all of the sort of yardsticks for looking at countries and particularly debt servicing costs, I just wonder, have you, have you done enough to sort of draw attention to what Raghu was talking about, the sort of hidden gearing that's built up for government debt, for the consolidated debt, where you can look and it says, you know, average maturity of government debt is X and it looks quite reassuring. And in the footnotes, perhaps, it says there's now this interesting issue related to QE. Yes, no, that's, that's right. If you look at the consolidated uh, government's balance sheet, which combines the central bank and the treasury, then yes, we've certainly moved to where the maturity has, has shortened because of all of the uh, purchases that were made by the central bank on the market. But it remains the case that when we worry about sharp swings in interest rates, the component that's sitting <coughs> The, the, the behavior, the pieces of public debt, which uh, are not the central, what are not being held by the central bank, are still important drivers of it. So, you know, we can have central banks have uh, income losses, and you know, as long as there's confidence in the currency, and as long as you're not, uh, uh, you know, people are so not going to show up and worry, worry about their ability to convert dollar into one dollar, and, and inflation is not expected to explode. It's a different. The way that these, the, you know, the, these two pieces of the balance sheet affect the economy are still different. I guess as long as investors don't decide to worry about it, but yeah, at the moment it seems to be different. Uh, Minister, we also mentioned the most fundamental thing for the long-term calculation is what we think is going to happen to long-term interest rates going forward. What are the assumptions that you're making? Have you reassessed the outlook for, for global uh, interest rates? Well, the... Actually, the, uh, the central bank and the uh, Ministry of Finance, we, we working together, as I said. So actually, every year we have to be agree upon, you know, the inflation target. Uh, for this year, it's the, in between the one to three percent, which is the, I think the, is ma uh, manageable. And the, uh, you know, some people say that the why uh, domestic interest rate in Thailand is so low, and the, when the where's the interest rate is so, so minimal. But that's the, because of the one thing that the, we, we just recover, beginning to recover and 
will be faster and faster because of the tourism industry that uh, making their our growth. Um, so there we also worry about the you know the how business uh, will get back to work. So uh, on the other hand, it becoming the the cost of the the business as well. So I think the uh, uh, and the our inflation is not uh, coming from the over consumption or over demand, but uh, basically from the cost side and the our policies uh, how to get there. Uh, uh, the, the energy efficiency in the inducing the energy, energy and the fertilizer that uh, we use more um, organic organic uh, fertilizer. That's part of thing that we have to agree that uh, uh, what what is our target? Okay. Um, uh, looking for the long term, I think that we of course that we assess the uh, the central bank have been closely monitoring the, the outlook and the expectation of the. The, the interest rate or inflation in, 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 in the long term. But as I said, uh, we are looking more on the, the long term growth. We need growth and you know, not only for, uh, uh, you know, for, for income of the people, but you know, the, our competitiveness as well. So I, I think the, uh, the fiscal policy, as I said, you know, um, uh, we're still on the expansionary path and some of the public investment, as I said, we need to accelerate at this time. But how uh, uh, this project, uh, this uh, investment will not be affecting the uh, fiscal burden. The other thing is the, you know, uh, <clears throat> by the uh, fiscal discipline law that we are, uh, the government has been limited uh, uh, how to spend, you know, not overspending in, in the case of the uh, unnecessary spending. The, uh, what we spent during the past two years, the basically on the uh, cash handout program and the sum of stimulus package, uh, giving daily allowance for the people to spend. That sort of the very popular for, for the people, but uh, right now it, is, uh, it has been phased out. All of the unnecessary or kind of the uh, populist uh, policy has been phased out. The other thing is also, you know, the, our discipline is there. Um, you cannot, you spend, uh, you cannot uh, uh, use the uh, advanced the, uh, expenditure. For example, you spending now and uh, pay back uh, by the government budget in the next fiscal year. That will be limit to uh, 30 or 32 percent. Because the, otherwise that, uh, you know, any government would like to spend more on the uh, uh, on the uh, populist policy that 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 uh, 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 prohibited in the in the law. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we've got a few minutes for questions, and I know there's people in the audience who will have good questions. Yes, if you just wait for the microphone. Thank you very much. My name is Hatip Basri. I'm former Minister of Finance of Indonesia. Um, I think the scattering effect of the pandemic will require the design of the fiscal policy. Uh, more into this uh, inclusive growth. This is inevitable. But we do understand that the rising uh, the cost of fund will also prevent the emerging economies. So in this case, I think it is important to look at about the quality of spending rather than talking about the increasing the budget. That's exactly what Indonesia did. We maintained the budget deficit. It's stipulated in our law should be less than 3%. And then we could reduce the debt to GDP, but at the same time, we could protect the vulnerable groups. I think we might take a couple point. more minutes. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Aya Khrifan. I'm a global shaper from Jordan, Amman Hub. And I have a question because, you know, Jordan has been facing a lot of economical challenges surrounding the refugee crisis, uh, now with the Ukrainian uh, Russian uh, conflict, also, which has basically caused an increase in the price of imports, so causing disruptions in the supply chain. Um, when you're looking at fiscal policies, I would really like to know more about how can we improve the quality of public spending. You said something really important about having sometimes public spending that is a bit not well targeted. So how can we improve the quality of public spending, especially in things related to climate adaptation? And in other words, how can we make public spending more performance oriented? Thank you. Uh, okay, take this one and then we'll come back. Federico Fubini, I'm a journalist from Italy. It's a question for Professor Rajan. 
Um, the theme uh, that you've been talking about, the fractured society, has been present since fault lines. But then now we see the US government spending lots of money, including Inflation Reduction Act, etc. What's your assessment on the, uh, of the impact of, of this big spending on reducing the fractures in US society? Well, I don't know whether, Gita, did you want to respond on the, or anybody else wanted to respond on the quality of public spending? Yes, I th uh, this is a clearly a very important issue. And uh, for several countries in the world, and particularly so for emerging and developing economies, uh, th there is a lot that they can gain in terms of fiscal space if they are able to do more in terms of the quality of the spending that they have, but also in terms of uh, raising sufficient tax revenue. I think on both counts, uh, there is a lot that can be done. Uh, what we have seen is the use of uh, you know, uh, a digital public infrastructure has actually been very helpful in this matter. When we look at countries who've actually been able to target their spending much better, uh, being able to, you know, having digital identity, having using digital uh, infrastructures to be able to make cash transfers uh, is, has been, is one way in which they've raised the effectiveness of, uh, uh, of the welfare schemes that they have. It's also been very helpful to ensure you have more tax collection. Uh, so on both those counts, uh, you know, that's one particular area in which uh, that, that pays off. But more generally, I think countries need to pay closer attention to where they spend. Uh, and uh, also, like I said, in terms of increasing the tax base, for a lot of these countries, the tax base is, is too narrow, and they would have to increase that too. So these are the measures that would be needed. Do you want to respond on that? Sure. Um, by the way, just on the issue of refugees, I certainly think one of the things we need to do far better is how to assimilate refugees into the labor force while they're in a particular country. That would reduce the fiscal burden a lot, but how to do it in an effective way without creating more social conflict domestically is, is, is a really important question. I mean, many countries just put them on a, on a, in a camp and prevent them from doing anything, and then they become a burden, and then they become a public policy concern, but is there a way that you could use their talents in, in effective ways. Um, on the issue of has the spending sort of ameliorated fractures, I mean, certainly growth lifts a lot of boats. And, and the, spend, the growth from the spending has been, been positive. You know, the US unemployment rate is really low, so a lot of people who are uh, on the margins have, have, have come back in. But I think there is really a, a question of capabilities of the labor force. And uh, it's not so much jobs, but good jobs, which they're looking for. And are they capable of the good jobs that are being, uh, being created? And this is where I think there's a much bigger question. Uh, I think there are lots of initiatives, certainly in the United States, on upskilling, on making you know, communities, disadvantaged communities, capable of, uh, of you know, they, their, their, their students sort of uh, reaching higher level jobs. There's a lot of computer training going on, a lot of automation, lots of experiments. But is spending making a difference there? I'm not so sure. Where I do worry is the tendency towards saying the spending has to be on our people. So there's a pro protectionist element, uh, certainly in the Inflation Reduction Act, which is very, very concerning. And, and what is the, the particularly the problem today is protectionism is, is sort of disguised by security concerns. So yes, we need to bring chips home, but we also need to bring clean production home. I mean, the two don't, don't necessarily have the same impact on security. Chips, yes. Glean, uh, clean energy, probably not. And that is where global cooperation would be much more needed. Incentives for domestic production, probably you, know, you don't want to reduce that. That kind of distinction I see less of, and that, to my mind, does more global damage uh, in the guise of helping local jobs. We've, we've basically run out of time. I just wanted to ask briefly, maybe the, the commissioner, uh, but also others, <clears throat> when you're thinking about the long-term investment challenges and all the challenges that we're, the, the tensions and the difficulties of fiscal policy we've talked about, the one thing that people tend to say can be put into a separate category as a long-term investment need is the funding of the green transition. And Raghu said a little bit about it, who should, who should bear the burden. 
Do you think there is a case for treating that differently and having uh, separate borrowing instruments if you're the European Union or um, a separate way of thinking about those long, that long-term investment challenge? Uh, yes, there is a case. And will you persuade Germany? <laughs> <laughs> I think there is a case and for the first time we have also, we are also experiencing in Europe a, a way uh, because uh, back to the quality of public expenditure, uh, of course we, we have been uh, proposing this, the European institution have been proposing this for years and years and years, uh, but now since a couple of years this uh, requests, this recommendation from the European institution uh, have money <coughs> attached to this, <coughs> which is the money of a common funding. And I think that we never had uh, such a big level of expenditure on future-oriented investment with different level of quality, of course, but um, I think extremely important. And also in the discussion you were referring to of our, fisc of our fiscal rules, uh, we are uh, addressing the necessity to incentivize uh, future-oriented investments. Uh, well, I don't want to enter in, in, the, in the ways. It's, it's not a classical golden rule, which is very controversial uh, in Europe, uh, but it is a way, so to say, you are gaining time if you uh, change the quality of your public expenditure in favor of future-oriented investment. So the issue I think for the first time since many, many years in Europe is connected to uh, real incentives and real advantages for countries that are moving properly. We had plenty more to discuss, but we have no more time. So thank you very much. I will only record, one gets complaints for talking about national stereotypes, but it was the Italian European Commissioner who talked about a love affair between fiscal and monetary policy on this panel. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much to everybody.